Hello. Sorry to keep you waiting. They they sort of scheduled me in two lectures at once. Maybe they thought there was a clone or something, but <laughs> there's just one. Then. So anyway. Um, uh, today, um, we're going to talk about a bit about the process of making things. I think that, that that's a really good topic. So I don't just want to show you some nice project we've been working on, but also to show you a bit um, the, the situation uh, behind it, the engine behind it. How do you come from idea to imagination to product? Because I think exactly that is how it works. One day you wake up and instead of the desire for a cigarette, um, you have an idea. And this idea, it becomes a part of you, of your body, uh, of your brain. You start to imagine how it will look like, eh? how it will behave, how it will, what kind of things it will generate, how it will trigger different kind of interactions. So this idea becomes sort of obsessive to you. It's sort of like a taste in your mouth of which you do not know the ingredients. You start to read, to write, to travel, whatever you think is necessary to make that idea become true. And this, I think, is the process of creativity in which we are in right now. And we learn how to merge the worlds of fantasy and pragmatism, to maneuver around the beauty and the bullshit that surrounds us, and somehow to realize that reality is not something static, eh, not something fixed, decided by government or general protocol, but it's actually quite liquid. It's something we build up together in the way how we interact, how we communicate, how we share our information and our, in and our emotions. And maybe somehow these kind of things are in the back of my brain when I make the things that, that, I, that I have to make. Eh. In a way, I am a voluntary prisoner of my own imagination. <laughs> you have to make it. Um, and uh, maybe it's interesting to sort of zoom a bit into that. Well, when we look at the pieces we've been working on in the last years, June was one of the first in that way. Here you see it placed in the pedestrian tunnel in uh, Rotterdam. Can I have some sound on this one? Where hundreds of fibers are brightened according to the sounds and emotion of people walking by. And I, I thought it was an interesting way to think of how can we use technology to make environments more human again, how to make them not a sort of static sum of walls, doors and windows, but actually more an extension of, of, of the behavior. Thank you. As a mediator. And also to get this sensation of environments which sort of has, has a mind of their own, that it becomes intuitive or scary or responsive. I think that's where we're heading uh, sooner or later towards to. And to add it actually, with not within the white cube of the Tate Modern or the Boymans, but place it in the, in the public space of the Maas Tunnel, it actually uh, became interesting and started gen generating different type of stories, so to speak. Um, here, this is a classical one, which I have to show you. Wedding couples who figure out uh, that June was available and it became a hotspot to have their, your wedding photo taken. So suddenly this old, dark, gray, scary tunnel was invaded by wedding couples who would go there uh, have their photo taken, play and scream with June, and then went away. Um, so it's interesting that in a way, we're going to talk a bit about more that later, that, that somehow when you make things and you create a dialogue, either it's within the work itself or placing it in a context or working with a specific client, a dialogue starts. It's not a repetition of your own thought or protocol, but things happen which are beyond your um, control. And that's actually, I think, really nice. When I'm talking about we, it's saying um, we, uh, th 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 I think the designer or the artist of today is not some kind of brilliant guy sitting in an attic cutting off uh, little pieces of, uh, of his ear. I've been talking about that uh, a lot actually. Uh, I, I hate that sentiment. I think today you should be this half priest, half entrepreneur. On one hand, have a very clear vision of what you want. And on the other hand, um, have the will to manifestate it, to make it happen and you need an engine for that. In this case, it's Studio Rosegard, a great team of young uh, designers, architects, electronic engineers, and together we make the things that we have in our brains. A studio in Shanghai, 
uh, based where we, where we work on the larger public spaces. So we spent an enormous amount of time on developing the, the technology, uh, the, the way it behaves, the way it reacts to you. And yes, we also steal from the right people, <laughs> really important. Um, intimacy uh, is one of those projects which is important in this case because this was a non-commissioned, it was a self-commissioned project which we started ourselves. Um, in which we were interested in what happens when tech jumps out of that screen, what happens when yeah, technology becomes a part of ourselves, is connected to our senses. Um, and we became fascinated with that element and started to make dresses made out of a smart material which change in transparency according to how intimate you are with someone. Here you see one of our latest versions connected to the heartbeat of the model, going from black to transparent, so the more uh, up her beat goes, like me now, because I had to run really hard, then it becomes more open, uh, and here it becomes more mellow again. And this is important because for two reasons which I want to share with you. One is this project forced me out of my own comfort zone. I am not a fashion expert, I'm sorry. <laughs> I know a lot about art and architecture, but suddenly you, know, you, you, you have to develop a sort of new ABC in order to communicate with the fashion designers, uh, with the way you, you make it, uh, with the way you produce it. Um, so that was really important to, 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 to search for that new language somehow, and that pushed in a way, uh, the, the, the way we communicated with each other to the studio to a next level. Uh, you have to create a common language. But secondly, as I said before, this is a self-commissioned project. No budget, no client, no context. And we worked with a material manufacturer to develop this material, but they were a bit reluctant to work with us, uh, unless we ordered a zillion of meters of the material, of course, which was not the case. So we made the first dresses anyway from some sample material that we got, put it online, the blogs picked it up, and it went viral. But then we had a problem with the project, because, again, there was no budget and no context, and the client and the, or the manufacturer was reluctant uh, to continue. Um, so we were in a dilemma how to continue with the process. But somehow the power of soft capital eh, start kicking in. The wife of the director of the manufacturer saw it online, it was a big fashion freak, and knew we were working together, and she made him, forced him to work with us. So that's how he called me on my phone. My wife tells me to work with you. And that, that was the beginning of the process, true story. And I think that is sort of fascinating, this relation between hard and soft capital. I could have easily made June in RGB to the media markets of this world and, and pay my rent and ling uh, live happily, uh, blah, blah, blah. But that would have been completely boring. So you have to balance, I think, uh, between beauty and bullshit, between the thing that pays your rent and the other, the things that, that, that pushes innovation. Um, I think that's sort of the struggle I think all of you are in right now, especially in a, in a, in a time like this, in a cultural uh, uh, climate within the Netherlands like this. And it's sort of critical to balance that, to self-initiate, because soft capital will always become hard capital. I, 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 I can, I can, I can, let's believe in that somehow. So intimacy got its own life in that way. Right now we're teaming up with new haute couture fashion designers, preferably Dutch, to work on a more wearable series because a lot of people saw this online and wanted to purchase one, of, win, uh, of which one is <laughs> our uh, Royal Highness uh, Maxima, which I'm here uh, trying to convince that if she would wear that dress, she would be one of the most innovative people in the world. <laughs> and uh, as you can see, her look is slightly fascinated, slightly scared, <laughs> which I think is exactly where we want her to be. Um, moving on, when we talk about sharing, eh, which is the, the, the theme of these two days, and exchanging and interaction. You cannot not incorporate sustainability because in a way sustainability is just basically understanding the relationship you and I have um, uh, with each other, with the world around us. The moment you understand that relation and you start fine-tuning it, things get better. Let's hope that. Eh? That's, that's the ideology, that's the, the priest in me which, which wants to do that. 
So what we did here with Sustainable Dance for the project that you see here, is literally dragging this more in a futuristic way, in which we say, don't talk about sustainability in reduction, do less, eh, fly less, etc. But let's build faster airplanes, do more. And making floors which per tile produces 20, 25 watts the moment you dance on it. This is a short movie. Toyota, a sponsors of green design. Which is interesting. Every time we take a step, we leave energy behind. What if we could capture this energy as a clean source of electricity? Dutch architects Dole are developing the technology to capture the energy of dancers like these, then using it to power the club's music and lights. Certain materials produce electricity when squeezed. This is known as the piezo effect. So a dance floor can become one big generator, turning every movement into new power. Longer. Uh, teamed up with Toyota to make the first one, and right now um, several floors are being made. Um, I don't have time to explain that project in advance, but I'll show you some projects uh, which sort of evolved from that ide ideology. Um, one day I was sitting in a car uh, on a Dutch uh, road, and with the back in my mind the sustainable dance floor, I was sort of amazed by these roads we drive on. Eh? We spend sort of millions, billions on them, but somehow nobody really seems to care how they behave, how they look like, how are they being maintained. They're just very, very functional. But at the same time, they hack our Dutch landscapes into little strips and, and, and pieces. So we started to research, hey, can we not do a little bit more with that? What if we can make smart highways, which are interactive or sustainable, researching uh, what kind of uh, things are already out there, Wageningen Universiteit, Rijkswaterstaat, TU Eindhoven, etc. A lot of people have been playing with this idea. It's been up in the air for a while. But a lot of these projects are sort of hidden in drawers or has, has not been put, uh, pushed further than the prototype. So we started to make these kind of artist impressions and thinking about it. Eh? How can we make this ro Route 66 of the future? Eh? How can we sort of combine experience and innovation into one? And basically I started to give lectures about it as I am doing now. Um, but also here, the project was in a dilemma because, yeah, we have no idea about roads in the same way about fashion. <laughs> so you have to team up, you have to create a dialogue with people who do. And also here, after a while, we were lucky. We got the call from the director of Heimans, one of the biggest road manufacturers of Europe, um, who saw the lecture, who was in the audience. And he asked me on my mobile phone a very simple, basic, almost very banal question. How much? <laughs> Which is the question you will get a lot when you have a good idea. Um, uh, that question was not answered uh, very easily, of course. So, but here you see us making a deal uh, to work together for the coming three years to build these kind of interactive uh, roads of the future. Um, a fascinating concept in a way that Heimans is a very good but very conventional, very old-fashioned, so to speak, uh, road manufacturer. They're very inf interested in asphalt but they have to move towards information technology as a company. Yes. So they know everything about the road of today. And fortunately, the designers, like you and I, are very good in knowing what will become tomorrow, or even a little bit more than that. And I think this is sort of an interesting photo in that way, because it shows that this is what we should be doing, eh? creating a sort of West Side story of two gangs who don't necessarily really belong to each other. Eh? <laughs> The, the artist who talks a lot like me, and then this uh, road manufacturer who has been doing it for a very, very long time, but feels forced and is also interested in pushing it forward. And they fall in love either way, because they have the desire to innovate this Dutch landscape. And right now, we're teaming up with them. This is one of the first examples I can show you. Um, there are many ideas, 22 of which we picked six, six and we will uh, build the prototypes in the coming months. First realization, end of 2013. This is one we're actually building right now, working with dynamic paints, which can change in transparency based on color. So that actually the moment the road is slippery, is cold, you will get the super crystal snow flocks in your road, so you can see where it's slippery or not. It's very functional, but you can also make it more poetic with letters or things like that. So suddenly the road knows, I'm warm, I'm, I'm cold, I'm ugly, I'm beautiful, I'm new. Um, uh, the road becomes an interface of information 
Uh, this kind of projects are struggles, are creative struggles. Eh? Uh, because you continuously have a client who asks how much, and I want to talk about value, eh? which is the same but so something completely different. But fortunately, we agreed to, to work with this non-understanding. And at the same time, one big step they made, why we said yes to this project, is because they were willing to pay for a process and not a product. And that is exactly the sort of belief you want to force a situation into. Um, and right now, actually, I'm trying to move them. I don't know if you know the logo, but it's sort of a, a, a yellow-brown logo and trying to move it more to a Ferrari yellow and going from Heimans to He-Man. But OK, we're, we're, we're not really <laughs> there yet. That will take some more sessions. Yeah. So sharing, in a way, of co-production with companies you have not uh, known before. And I, I, I just want to zoom in a bit more on that because it, it's important to do that because 16 Chapel, Michelangelo, was commissioned by the Catholic Church of that time, the shell of that period, who literally said, like, hey, mister, uh, what do you think about it? And right now we, we experience as a classical, uh, very important painting, Rembrandt, Nachtwacht, Rotko, you name it. A lot of projects are made in commission. And I think it's incredibly fascinating to, to, to find that moment in which you are not prostituting your own idea. Uh, th 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 this is important. Do not do RGB June for media market but find this friction, enjoy it, and start activating it. That's when the magic starts kicking in. When we talk about sharing, um, sharing is, of course, not without consequence. Eh? It's not something virtual or just a conversation. Actually, our whole landscapes that we see around us are physical consequences of the way we think. Eh? There are skins, there are interfaces. And especially when you look in the Netherlands, um, everything you see around us is man or woman made. Eh? We live under sea level. But somehow time starts to influence this, this way of heritage. The windmills that we see now here at Kinderdijk, they look as a touristic uh, 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 trip where you go and have photo take photos of. But of course they were not. They are landscape machines. They keep the water level in the right way. Huh? They were made to, 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 to process bread, etc. So somehow they, they are machines which make landscape but by time and time, we are connecting a more cultural and emotional value to it. I think that's, that's sort of interesting to use, that element. And somehow, that principle, I started to apply it when we won the commission for uh, Maasvlakte 2 in Rotterdam, where the havenbedrijf, the, the, the port, are placing 15 uh, windmills, new huge windmills, in that area. And they invited us, after commission, uh, to make a huge light artwork of 7.5 kilometers from that. In as a sort of soft icon, as, uh, as they said. We started to look, in a way, not so much at the windmills itself, but more in how they behave. Eh? And when you look at the windmill, eh, you have them uh, at Afsluitdijk, etc., all of them are moving a little bit different, which is driving the engineers completely insane. <laughs> but they're all a bit, eh, they're, they're still handmade, whether you like it or not. So there's this intonation of mo motion and of movement, which I find is really interesting, eh, where this nature and technology, they start to collide. And we started to merge that within the design, as you see here in the first the raw artist impression, literally connecting the tipping points of the, of the windmills, which go 320 kilometers uh, per, per, uh, per hour, and creating these sort of lines between them. Yeah, sometimes very silent. Sometimes when the wind goes up, there are more. Creating these sort of matrix type of shapes. Kinderdijk uh, 2.0. So, it's, uh, so, so yeah, I, I'm not sure what the title will be. But I did almost nothing. Eh? I just drew a line. It, it's, it's so that's, I think, the designer or the artist or the entrepreneur of today should be doing, eh, creating this kind of uh, missing link, in a way. Tonight, we have something special. Um, I just want to want to emphasize a bit on that one. Um, we have a new project, which you do not know yet, <laughs> because it's not online, um, Crystal. And uh, I'm very proud to, uh, uh, to be able to present that uh, to you tonight. We teamed up with the people from Picnic and Eye Museum. Crystal is actually completely about sharing, and uh, it's weird with these ideas. Eh? They're floating in the air. We met six months ago and realized we were talking about the same things, in which we wanted to push the element of June to a next level. Eh? June is nice, it's interaction, you can touch it, but you can never take it home. 
Well, crystals actually exactly doing that, these kind of salt crystals we made with two LEDs in it, which are charged with a wireless, when they lay on the ground, are charged with a weak magnetic field. And the moment you walk over it, they start to light up. And this is outside. So if you uh, have a moment and you want to come by and write your letter or steal one and take one home, you can do that tonight at 8 o'clock. And I think it's sort of an interesting way of literally saying that you, it's about light, it's about um, uh, social interfaces, but at the same time it's an experiment, because yeah, in the end the complete work can be taken. So uh, I will uh, <laughs> see how, 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 what is your true agenda uh, tonight <laughs> and see what kind of experience will happen. To conclude, we've been talking about merging fantasy and pragmatism. We've been talking about uh, finding a relationship between beauty and bullshit, about client and context and things like that. But I want to conclude with a happy story about true love, about true interaction, and about true shareability. This is a story I experienced traveling in India about a tiger who, who um, her five little puppies died when she was born. And she got very, very depressed. And the caretaker of the zoo got concerned because she didn't want to eat and she was he was afraid that she would die. So he came up with an idea. <laughs> and he took the skin of the five little tigers, dead tigers, got five little piggies, wrapped it around them, and put the five little piggies in the cage and waited. And a miracle happened. Huh? The tiger accepted them as they're newly born. And as you can see here, they live happily together right now. I think this is what we should be doing. We should merge realities. We should find the missing link. We should involve ourselves in co-production, which results to uh, symbiosis you and I haven't even imagined of, literally, and to realize that we are that caretaker, we are that tiger, we are that picky. Thank you. <laughs>